Daniela Cambone, and welcome back to the summer series here on Stansberry Investor. Today we are talking Ethereum and its much hyped and somewhat controversial London hard fork, which has just been activated. What does it mean? Why should we be following it? Why should we care? Joining me now is Frank Holmes. He's the CEO of US Global Investors. He's also the executive chairman of Hive Blockchain. So Frank, I could not think of a better person to speak with today about the London hard fork. Welcome back. It's great to be back with you, Daniela. And yes, it is a big deal, but every one of these upgrades to the Ethereum ecosystem just basically improves the price of Ethereum. Uh, and there's this whole thought process that Bitcoin mining is going to uh, impact uh, Ethereum, then Ethereum mining is going to go away. It, 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 there's so much noise out there. So let's just talk about Ethereum. There's, we validate a transaction every few seconds and we get paid in new Ethereum points for validating a, a crypto uh, uh, program. And, and there's fees for other transactions. This upgrade is to try to lower those additional bonus fees that we earn. And if that happens that all that's really doing is going to lower the supply, demand is growing, prices go up. So Ethereum is up 4%. Uh, Hive Blockchain is the first crypto mining company to go public. It's also the only one to be mining Ethereum and Bitcoin. And I've been saying this for, for years now, this proof of stake versus proof of work, that proof of work is not going away overnight for Ethereum mining. And every one of these upgrades is actually good for the network and good for Hive. We hodl. Uh, tens of thousands of Ethereum, uh, these virgin coins in a cold wallet. So as Ethereum goes up, our balance sheet goes up. So Hive is a proxy for those who do not want to go buy Ethereum and Bitcoin as an asset class. They buy Hive as that proxy. Right. Because what was happening and the reason I guess they needed to make changes is that with the explosive growth of DeFi and of NFTs, which are built around Ethereum, there were certain things happening that were driving people nuts. And they're like, look, we have to make changes to the code here, right? So right. The the day, how does it impact you know, investors, does it? Well, it, it, to a certain degree for us, for miners, we were getting these incredibly additional fees. Last right. summer in particular, as DeFi took off uh, and the fees were great bonuses. Uh, if, if they decline, they decline. The demand's not going to go away. So if you have less supply of Ethereum in the marketplace and you have growing demand from NFTs, from stable coins, uh, like JP Morgan stable coin is like a money market fund. And you have growth in all these different types of unique products uh, that basically use the Ethereum backbone. It just drives up the, the, the prices, limit supply, increase the demand, prices go up. It's simple. This is what's going on. Uh, I think it's very bullish for us. Well, I was going to say, that's exactly what we're seeing now, a run up in the price of Ether. So I was going to ask you, is this a coincidence? Does it have, you know, how much does it have to do with the London hard fork here? Well, it has a lot to do because the supply is being limited from the gas fees, they're called, these additional fees. So the, it means it's going to be less uh, fees out there, less e ether coming out of them, out of this ecosystem. And, but the demand's not growing away. So therefore it's going to drive prices higher. We mine it, we put it, save it in a bank account or in a cold wallet, basically. And, uh, our assets are a balance sheet are rising. Okay. And just as a side note, uh, the name has very little to do with the city in London. But moving on now, Frank, uh, I want to bring up a point that you actually emailed me earlier. You said as of the end of June, as many as 221 million people around the world uh, were participating in the crypto ecosystem at this point, including trading, investing and making transactions in Bitcoin, Ether and other digital coins. That's 221 million people and growing uh, what's the future look like five to 10 years out here, Frank? Well, there's 120 million of that is, are Bitcoiners. And, uh, and what people have to recognize is the ecosystem is so broad and so deep. I try to tell this to the gold world. There are not 10,000 gold analysts around the world, but there's 10,000 Bitcoin nodes, people vigorously, rigorously looking at. Uh, and when it comes to the ecosystem of Ethereum, we're talking about for numbers of, I hear, 30,000 
Uh, and when you go to these conferences, like we're in Miami, there's no gold conference where 12,000 people spend $600 to get in the door. Uh, but you have that in any of these crypto events. I was last uh, two weeks ago back in Miami for just the Miners Association and equipment and sales, et cetera. The tickets were $1,500 a ticket at a C-class hotel, and it was sold out. So there's something happening in this global ecosystem, and it's just not going away. And I have to agree with Michael Saylor. It is digital property. When you buy a Bitcoin, it's digital property. Well, I think crypto keys or holding the keys to, uh, to a cryptocurrency is the highest property right that the human race has ever invented to date. We can't have stronger property rights than holding $100 million with password keys in your head or multi-signature keys. Uh, everything else is a weaker property, right? And, and the fact that more people can buy fractals with PayPal, they don't have to go and spend $39,000 for one Bit Bitcoin. They can buy a fraction of that with their PayPal account. That's a big game changer where the demand is growing faster than the supply. Uh, going back uh, 18 months ago, it was every, every day there was new coins of 1,800 Bitcoins a day mined. Now it's 900. In three years, it's going to drop to 450. So that supply is shrinking down to a, a final number of 21 million coins. And more people are embracing it. They can buy fractals. It can easily go to $100,000 a coin. So based on current uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin prices, Hive is generating daily income of 550,000, which translates to an annual run rate of 200 million, okay? Couple this with your point on the ecosystem and to your point about how you've come from the gold world, are you now leaning more towards crypto, Frank? No, I, I think that in the world of asset allocators and pension funds, et cetera, um, and, and a lot of that love trade, 60% of gold demand is always love. And that love trade is so important that they have to physically see their gold. It's like uh, the intangible of love gets validated for the engagement ring with a diamond. So something tangible for intangible. Well, the same thing is with gold is that tangible feel. You need electricity for Bitcoin to function. Uh, you don't need that for gold. So I think that they're both inclusive in an asset class and of a diversified portfolio manager, the volatility of gold is much, it's, it's like 1%, the same as the S&P 500, but the supply of that is a lot less. So therefore for the past 20 years, it's far outperformed Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and it's outperformed the S&P 500 by 250%. So Ray Dalio having an exposure to gold as an asset class has definitely helped his overall uh, becoming the largest hedge fund manager in the world. You know, what's interesting. I feel there's so many personalities, you know, I've covered the gold landscape for over a decade and there's so many different personalities, right? As you know, Frank, and I feel you now going to those gold conferences. I know you're still a keynote at many of them. I like that soothsayer that shows up and says, I have seen the future and it is crypto. Um, I know offline we were talking how miners, Gold miners, silver miners, all precious metals miners, base metal miners should be looking at blockchain more and more. Do you think that the industry will be more receptive? I'm talking the precious metals industry to blockchain. Well, I, I think there's a they should be embracing blockchain for sure. Uh, the idea of, of another level of accounting. Uh, there's double entry accounting and blockchain is basically triple entry accounting and Bitcoin validates that it works. So why not have their goal that's mined from safe areas, have a, a code, a blockchain on them so that they can say it's not blood gold. And, and just like they've had to do for diamonds and so that they're, they're, they're not blood diamonds. They have to start thinking this way. And also Daniela, if they have free cash flow like Barrick and Newmont and they come out and say, I'm the chairman CEO and I'm saying gold is undervalued. Well, then don't sell it. Hold it, just like the Bitcoin mining companies, like MicroStrategy is doing, and just like we're doing at High Blockchain. All right, right. And that's what Michael Saylor was saying, is that why don't they have it on their balance sheets? Uh, but my point, and I agree with you, that the industry should be receptive to blockchain. Why do you think the resistance? Is it just resistance to change? Is it the cost? Is it, it would take too much brain power to think of? And it's like, oh, let's just forget about it. Why the resistance? 
Well, because they all think that Warren Buffett is the Messiah. I mean, literally, you know, everything comes to, he didn't like Amazon, he missed that too. He hates gold. <laughs> and he hates gold and, and he hates Bitcoin. And uh, uh, he blew out all of his jets last year where we know from data points, 25,000 Robin Hooders uh, bought at uh, 12 to $13 and it doubled for them. And he gave up all that money. So I, I think that a lot of them have to change. And I think a lot of the CEOs are much stronger. I have also said in the Bitcoin mining industry, uh, my peers now, I'll give you an interesting data point. Four years ago, when I first talked about it, I got ridiculed for it. And I know this from this from YPO, uh, that guys thought I was crazy. And there was only like a handful of people that were embracing Bitcoin four years ago. Today, at the, in the Miami conference, we see there was 40 of them. And I'm told this week, there's 600 around the world. So you have a universe of CEOs, there's 600 now that have embraced from six to 600 in only four years. So something's happening in these young CEOs around the world that they're embracing Bitcoin as a unique asset class, as a piece of digital property. Uh, and I think that this is only going to grow. Gold mining company CEOs and their boards have to wake up to using AI for their exploration. They have to use the digital world to improve their exploration results. Just the same that they should be looking at uh, holding their gold. Okay, to this point, uh, just quickly, I want to share a slide you shared with me that shows the volatility uh, in Bitcoin and gold. If you can talk to it a bit, I know this was your most popular slide at the Bitcoin show in Miami. What, what's important is that every asset class has this unique DNA of volatility. Uh, and just like having identical twins, they're, one is left-handed and one is right-handed. And there are going to be differences, even though they're identical. So they both have their own unique DNA. And same thing with asset classes. So we see that the stock market and gold have the same, same DNA of volatility over one day of trading, over 10 days of trading. But gold stocks are much more volatile. And Bitcoin and Ethereum are more volatile. And uh, companies like MicroStrategy are volatile like Bitcoin and Tesla. And Hive is more volatile because Ethereum is more volatile over one day and 10 days. So before you go into these disrupting asset classes, you have to really respect and appreciate that DNA of volatility. Well said, Frank. You mentioned Michael Saylor. He's a good friend of our show here at Stansbury. And I know you will be having a webcast with him August 18th, correct? Correct. Where do and we get more info for that? Well, uh, go to our website at usfunds.com and you'll be able to get lots of information on it. Uh, and uh, Michael's going to talk about you know, the, his philosophy. I think he did a great job at an interview with you on a debate. Uh, but it's really about, micro, for us, it was about microstrategy as a stock to buy because it gives you this highly, it's a, a technology company with 500 million in revenue and cash flow, but a huge balance sheet investment in Bitcoin. So it trades with Bitcoin, it trades daily. So you don't want to go buy Bitcoin or you, then you turn around and you buy MicroStrategy, you get this incredible delta to the upside. And if you want to buy, uh, don't want to buy Ethereum and Bitcoin, then you can look at Hive for consideration as it's the proxy. And it's done exactly that, it trades, uh, 92%. Well, a lot of people think just buying micro strategy is like buying Bitcoin. It's a play. Absolutely. Right. So, all right. Good thoughts. We'll be watching. Um, thank you so much, Frank. By the way, I like the identical twins analogy. Makes a lot of sense. Hits home for me. So come back soon to Stansberry Investor, okay? Thank you, Daniela. And thank you for watching. We'll have much more from our summer series coming to you here on Stansberry Investor. In the meantime, if you want to watch premier content and special offers you can't get anywhere else, sign up at DanielaComboni.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.